Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Super Spreader Seminar Series. So before we move forward, we would like to acknowledge the land that the Omni Networks head office is located on the York University and it recognizes uh, that many indigenous nations have long standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. So a little bit about the super spread in a spreader seminar series. This series is hosted by postdocs for postdocs or for highly qualified uh, professionals such as uh, graduate students. And the aim of this super spreader seminar series is to provide a platform to present the research, uh, research ideas, experiences, and establish connections amongst the highly qualified personnel, such as postdocs and graduate students. So our speaker today is uh, Dr. Kamal Acharya. He is a veterinarian and an epidemiologist uh, with an interest in veterinary public health. Uh, he did his DVM from Nepal and he did his master's from Free University Berlin and Chiang Mai University, Thailand and a PhD from the University of Sydney. And he's currently working as a postdoc primarily at the University of Montreal, and he also has been working at the University of Guelph. His principal work during his PhD uh, was focused on mycobacterium paratuberculosis, and that's what he's going to talk about today. Uh, and he's interested overall in assessing and addressing public health threats that are intricately linked to the animal uh, interface. So without further ado, I would like to um, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Kamal Acharya. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Sir. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, hello. Perfect. Okay, thank you. That's great to know. And am I being heard perfectly? Yep. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, uh, for um, coming to my talk today. I'm super excited to um, share with you um, some of the aspect of evaluating diagnostic tests of infectious diseases with a reference um, is like uh, the paratuberculosis diagnosis. Um, I'm Kamal Achari, as Sid said, and I work at um, primarily the University of Montreal um, under this Omni Reunis uh, project, uh, and also working um, uh, with the uh, um, University of Guelph and uh, Prince Edward Island um, PEI. Um, so, first of all, uh, looking at those two pictures of animals possibly suffering from chronic condition, what thoughts come inside your head? So keep that thought for a while while we proceed. Uh, as a background, uh, Yoni's disease or paratuberculosis um, is uh, chronic debilitating enteritis of domesticated and wild ruminants, uh, which leads to wasting and eventually death in clinical cases. The causative organism is Mycobacterium avium subspecies paratuberculosis. And this disease has been known since long time. It was first described by uh, Yonis and Frothingham in 1895. Uh, as you can see on the right hand side, um, um, the cr chronic um, grelo, um, chronic um, enteric lesion in the animal and the uh, wasting that you can see in this animal. So um, there are several causes that are associated with Yoni's disease or paratuberculosis. Um, 
which makes it important um, um, livestock disease, at least ruminants disease. So the biggest thing is production losses, milk, meat, wool, uh, production drastically reduces. Even uh, some farmers uh, has experienced that the quality of the wool also decreases in um, ovines. And there is a um, high calling rate due to this disease. There, is, there are a lot of management costs associated with uh, biosecurity, testing the animals and management of the disease animals. And another important aspect of this um, um, disease cost is um, compromised animal welfare. Uh, as you remember the picture that I showed earlier, um, those chronic wasting diseases has a big um, impact on um, consumers from animal welfare point of view. And some research has um, estimated the cost because of that. And there is also an impact on international trade of animals and animal products. Although um, OIE or European Union um, have not um, uh, put this disease uh, like um, of concern for, sorry, international trade, but um, some countries, if they have like a low level of uh, paratuberculosis uh, prevalence in their territory can use the sanitary and phytosanitary measures of uh, World Trade Organization as an instrument to prevent the entry of um, products from other countries, as was um, exemplified in one case in 2016 in Australia. And there is also a big public health concern um, of this disease because um, a potential role of mycobacterium paratuberculosis in Crohn disease, uh, chronic enteritis of human, uh, has been suspected, although it has not been um, proved, but there are like some evidence that uh, provides some strength to this suspicion. So this may um, um, lead to demand for low contamination levels of MAP in food of animal origin, especially if that food is um, intended for immunocompromised and immunoinsufficient um, population, for example, old people um, um, and, or kids. So that is a concern. And um, on the right hand side, you, we can see um, an estimate of annual cost of uh, UNH disease in dairy cattle um, that was done by Rasmussen et al. in 2021. Um, so it, as you can see, um, yeah, most um, the annual cost was super high in millions, almost 200 million US dollar for the United States dairy industry. And then there was like a low level estimate for Canada. Um, the difference cannot be like obviously compared because um, the number of samples that has been included in this study is variable, varying a lot. Um, but still to give a context, there's huge cost that has been recognized and estimated due to Yoni's disease. Therefore, Yoni disease control is a priority for producers or uh, to rephrase it should be a priority for producer. Be, um, as, a, uh, as a consequence, um, industry-led voluntary control programs have been initiated in many countries. Uh, I think um, uh, review uh, identified 20, 22 countries that have um, uh, paratuberculosis control programs in place at various states, um, some active, some inactive. And the objective of um, most of those um, uh, programs has been to reduce prevalence for some countries, for example, Sweden, um, have also targeted eradication of the disease. So uh, the principle behind the control program is to prevent new infection by adopting strict biosecurity measures so that the within farm and between farm um, transmission of the disease can be prevented. Um, which involves a lot of testing at individual animal level and um, population level, as well, um, early detection and removal of infected animals by using test and call is another um, avenue of um, Johnny's disease control. We, uh, looking into both of those, um, we can 
clearly specify that um, diagnostic test has a very important role in Yoni's disease control, which is obvious with all other infectious diseases, but more importantly for chronic diseases like Jones. And another um, um, control approach that has been taken um, in some countries, for example, Australia and Spain is using a uh, vaccine in ovines with, uh, with mixed results, um, but overall uh, the producer has experienced a reduction in prevalence of the disease. And what are the challenges with Johnny's control? The disease is chronic. The animal, um, the pathogen can survive in, it, although the pathogen is um, uh, strictly intracellular pathogen, but it can survive in the uh, external environment because of its cell wall for a very extended period of time. And it is resistant to a lot of um, disinfectants that are, are being used in our farm and premises. And the um, diagnostic tests that have been dev devised for this disease are not perfect and um, does not always serve the purpose for which they were developed. So um, now focusing a little bit on the diagnostic, um, Usually the uh, Joni's disease diagnostics use both anti-mortem and post-mortem approaches. In the anti-mortem uh, approaches, um, blood, feces, milk, lymphatics, um, and rarely biopsy samples and environmental samples are tested uh, to detect the immune response or um, the viable map or its DNA or using culture or PCR or ELISA and then the main rationale for doing anti-mortem um, um, test of um, Bionis disease is to confirm exposure, infection, and infectivity of the um, animal, and also evaluate the control or surveillance program, and also aid decision-making at animal level and farm level. Whereas the post-mortem um, um, test, which gives uh, information about the animal um, after they are dead, um, uses intestinal and mesenteric lymph nodes, which are um, um, the payer spaces, um, which are the main predilection site of this pathogen, and the, those are collected at abattoir, and the, these have been found to be like more um, sensitive and specific than um, other types of tests. Um, usually tissue culture, PCR, and histopathological lesion examination is being done to confirm um, JD in those sample types. Although it doesn't give information about the living animal, but it can give feedback um, with regard to disease control management programs on farm or as a surveillance tools to determine the prevalence of the disease in a farm. Um, so broadly speaking, if we can um, uh, make use of both anti-mortem and post-mortem um, tests, I think we can increase the efficiency of detecting Johnny's disease. And another important group of tests is uh, measuring the immune response for Yoni's disease. Um, so a lot of um, work has been done to uh, identify the cell-mediated immunity as a tool to detect Yoni's. Um, so there are like skin tests that uh, measures the delay type of hypersensitivity. And then there are like interferon gamma assays, which uh, measure the exposure, lymphocyte proliferation, and um, measurement of interleukin test. However, this test has a big problem. So the, uh, their specificity is affected by infection with other mycobacteria. This is cross reaction because it's not like very specific response. Cell mediated immunity are like less specific than humoral. And there is also um, lack of practicality for detection of subclinical animals. And another problem with this uh, cell mediated immunity test is like the exposure does not predict infection status. Uh, another immune response that we can measure is humoral immunity. Um, of all the humor, humoral immunity assays, ELISA has been found to be most sensitive and specific. Uh, it is high throughput, um, it is cost effective, and has been widely used as hard level screening test. The sensitivity, however, depends on the state of the disease, prevalence of the disease, rate of fecal setting, um, However, these observations are not consistent across all the studies that has been done. 
and the specificity of ELISA can um, also depend on the infection with other mycobacterial or environmental mycobacteria, and also the vaccination status of the animal. Uh, another problem with um, ELISA is that uh, the serological finding um, might correlate with the development of JDs, but it doesn't always reflect the disease progression. So um, it might not always um, go with how the disease is progressing. So maybe we can use humoral and cell-mediated immunity to um, try to identify subclinical animals. And, and then we have culture, which um, um, is considered to be a gold standard test of JD. Um, uh, so uh, there are like solid and liquid culture uh, media where um, liquid has been found to be like more sensitive compared to solid culture media. Um, traditionally, we have been using um, um, culture as a standard test and against which uh, we, will, uh, we have been um, assessing other diagnostic tests. It is highly specific, um, obviously, um, but um, there are a lot of false positive test results. There is a phenomena where um, um, the, an anim animal passively sets um, um, live bacteria when the pasture has been um, contaminated by high seders. And it has been found that some of these animals uh, never get infected or um, establish the disease. So those types of false positive test results are some concern for uh, fecal, cul uh, the culture, uh, fecal culture, especially. And there are additional limitations in terms of culture. It's like very intensive procedure and it is time consuming at least 12 weeks um, is required to confirm the bacteria. And another problem with fecal culture is um, its sensitivity can be um, affected by an essential step of decontamination where um, we try to reduce um, or eliminate other pathogens, fungus, bacteria in the sample, fecal sample, um, because we are incubating the sample for 12 weeks. So we don't want other bacteria and fungus. Do, while doing that, um, there is also a reduction in the load of my, um, mycobacterium process. And another is um, when there is a low fecal setting, um, as we said, decontamination re reduce at least one log of uh, the load of bacteria. So if there is a low fecal setting, then this will lead to reduction in sensitivity. And then there is like you know, the um, intermediate setting is, um, has been um, identified in animals that have been infected with uh, Johnny's disease. So yeah, th that will also um, reduce the sensitivity of the fecal culture. And as I said, so can culture of tissue homogeneous from the predilection site of the organism can be the gold standard. Although we can think and we can combine different tissues um, and pull them together um, and then do the test to enhance the sensitivity of um, tissue culture, but practically, yeah, it is again difficult to achieve because um, the information that we get only after the animal is dead. So now, are molecular tests better than ELISA? Um, so a lot of PCR and qPCR tests are there and they have been used uh, because of their high throughput nature. Uh, and they have been especially used for confirmatory diagnosis and also for um, screening purpose as a hard level test. Um, and there was one test that was um, um, developed in Australia, high throughput Yoni's direct fecal qualitative uh, quantitative PCR test with a reported specificity of 99% and sensitivity of 60% in bovine and 84% in ovine, which is like um, close enough to uh, what has been reported for um, commercial ELISA, IDEX ELISA um, that is being used in Australia. Um, and the use for this um, uh, qPCR test for surveillance and confirmation um, is widespread throughout the world. And there are like other conflicting um, uh, information from literature um, about the sensitivity um, of qPCR being higher than ELISA or at least 
closer to ELISA because, for example, in US, um, they consider it closer to ELISA and both of them are used uh, for um, screening purposes. And uh, another thing is, um, according to the pathology of the disease, uh, again, it is not clear. So once the humoral immunity um, starts, um, there is um, also the initiation of fecal setting. However, um, when um, the correlation was assessed for ELISA and QPCR, so there are some studies that has um, found low, low cor correlation, um, which is potentially due to intermittent fecal setting and um, also inherent characteristics of the test because both of them are testing different aspects of uh, the disease process. And another limitation with um, uh, molecular test is um, we cannot differentiate between live or dead map, which may not always be, um, the information may not be useful um, if we cannot discriminate this. And PCR inhibition uh, can lead to false negative test result um, because uh, molecular test has been found to be um, inhibited due to the presence of um, several compounds in the DNA extract. And um, there can be false positive when there are like um, close related uh, mycobacterium and other pathogens. Although um, when uh, a test is being um, validated, all of these um, steps um, to remove the false positive is implied, but still um, there are a lot of unknowns which might impact the test. So let us see how um, we can, um, we, our essay is developed and validated. It is according to the terrestrial manual of um, World Organization of Animal Health, OIE. So um, once the essay is developed, which involves a de definition of the intended uh, purpose of the essay, and then a study is designed um, uh, and then everything is optimized, uh, repeatability um, is assessed. Um, then comes the essay validation pathway. So the first stage is um, um, determining the analytical specificity and sensitivity. At, at the stage, analytical specificity stage, uh, for example, for QPCR, um, we try to um, test the um, essay against a lot of known bacteria and fungus that can cross react with the, with the test and try to remove that. Um, and then um, the analytical sensitivity will then determine the limit of detection of um, the assay. So today I would like to focus on uh, diagnostic specificity and diagnostic sensitivity um, of the test, uh, trying to see what ha has been done and what can be done um, for paratuberculosis diagnostic test. So briefly on the purpose of diagnostic assays. Um, so six main reasons why a diagnostic assays are designed. One would be demonstrate freedom from infection in defined population. So the key word here is um, defined population, right? Not only the species, but also uh, sometimes it is context specific. For example, uh, if we have developed or are trying to develop a universal test for paratuberculosis, that might uh, fail because the setting of um, um, how the farm animals are raised across the walls are different. And it has been identified that um, uh, feed uh, is uh, one of the major contributor to um, PCR inhibition. So um, if we um, uh, try to develop a, and validate a test in a barn setting and try to implement the test in free range setting, then that might not work. So we have to take that into consideration. Um, so uh, de demonstrating freedom means um, free with and without vaccination. And another is um, once um, um, the freedom has been compromised, reestablishment of freedom after outbreaks. Another is to certify freedom for infection or presence of antigen in, in, in individual animals or product, which is also again, um, so another uh, aspect of 
one is disease diagnosis, and another is eradication of disease or elimination, elimination of infection from defined population, or confirmed diagnosis of suspected or clinical cases, estimate prevalence, and also determine the immune status of individual animals or population. Uh, so as I mentioned, we will focus on evaluating performance of a test, um, accuracy of the test. So uh, sensitivity and specificity are two attributes of a diagnostic test. So for um, assessing those, um, we need a disease status, confirmed disease status, which is D plus and D minus, is presence of disease and absence of disease. And then we, once we um, have those population, then we do the, conduct the test. And then we have like test positive and test negative results. So um, if we know uh, the disease, true disease status and the, and the test has identified um, a fraction of those, uh, that is test positive, true test positive results. However, there, are, there can be some samples um, that are not, uh, that are disease positive, but the test failed to identify, and those are false negative um, test results. Similarly, uh, if the test has identified some samples wrongfully, um, that those are uh, false negative test results, false positive test results, sorry. And then um, if the test can identify correctly the negative disease status, then those are true negative test results. So this simple calculation is um, can be used, the probability measure can be used to um, calculate the sensitivity and specificity of a diagnostic test. So sensitivity is uh, the probability that um, the uh, test provides positive test results in diseased animals. So, um, so which is like the fraction uh, two test positive out of the total uh, animals that were diseased. And again, for specificity, it's the probability that um, the test is negative, um, provided the disease is also negative. So the, that fraction is test negative out of um, total of um, test negative and um, false positive. So this is easier said than done because first of all, we need a population whose true disease status is known. And as we know from uh, my previous discussion that um, Yoni's disease um, is a chronic disease and the tests that we have are imperfect. So we might never know the true, true disease status um, of a population with, with 100% certainty. So in that case, um, researchers have used, for example, um, historically, um, known test negative um, animals, for example, to um, determine the specificity of the test. But uh, those um, are like less likely to be obtained because paratuberculosis is endemic all across the world. And the prevalence, although there are not recent good um, prevalence studies um, available, but um, we know for a fact that those are prevalence um, are higher based on the research that has been done previously. So um, if we have a gold standard test, which can perfectly discriminate between diseased and not disease, healthy animals, then if a test can identify all the diseased animals and healthy animals perfectly, then in that case, the sensitivity and specificity are 100%. This will be the case with the gold standard test. But for unfortunately, um, there is no any perfect gold standard test, uh, test that can be considered gold standard for Yoni's disease. So in that situation, we, we have to um, work with um, imperfect test and try to assess them against each other. So um, for that purpose, um, we access some uh, samples that were archived in um, the University of um, Sydney. 
which came from beef cattle herd in Australia with high prevalence of um, Unis disease. Uh, and the disease was evident clinically, microscopically, and serologically. And um, as mentioned earlier, so now we are using an imperfect uh, test, fecal culture as a gold standard, uh, and to try to assign the animals a disease status. Uh, the sensitivity of um, that fecal culture has been estimated to be 0 0.30, and its specificity is 0.9 and almost 1. And the test that we wanted to assess um, is um, the STJQPCR, uh, the test that has been validated earlier. So this two by two contingency table um, uh, shows how the test performed against the disease status, which was um, again identified by an imperfect code standard. So the sensitivity and specificity um, was estimated um, as follows. Um, the sensitivity of the, the QPCR was estimated 55% and specificity 93%. But there is a problem with specificity, right? Uh, because those animals, those population that we use to estimate it has not to be exposed. So, um, maybe that is not a unique sample that we should be using um, to assess the specificity. Usually um, people, um, scientists, they use um, a population that has never been exposed to the disease and test them with uh, the imperfect test to confirm that there is no disease, which is again, not 100% perfect, but it's still, that's better than what um, has been done here, right? And, uh, while testing those um, samples, we also um, assessed if they have uh, any inhibition, um, evidence of inhibition. Then we found that um, almost 20% of those extracts had some evidence of inhibition. And once we saw that, we um, uh, tried to figure out the best way to reduce those inhibition. And we found that five-time dilution of uh, those DNA extract was one of the best way that we could use. And now we are still using the fecal culture as the gold standard test, and we try to see how the new test performs. So there is some changes um, in the contingency table, and the sensitivity has increased drastically. But as we can see here, we lost some specificity, which is natural because this test is not um, a gold standard, and the negative that was confirmed by fecal culture might not be always negative. Now, um, another approach we did was to um, use those two test results in parallel, which is what um, we usually um, being done to use two tests in parallel to increase the sensitivity of the test. So, um, because our, um, our intention was to increase the sensitivity of um, the test, so, Consequently, the sensitivity has um, raised 80%. And yeah, obviously we lost specificity, but then uh, sensitivity is um, um, useful in instances where we um, want, to, want to know all the um, positive animals. Um, for example, if we can treat them or if we want to control the disease. As um, seen, um, the strategy that has been uh, and that are usually used um, are not perfect. So uh, we then uh, looked into the literature about the other alternatives method that can be used to evaluate the test. So um, th those uh, so-called non-gold standard methods, right? So um, so one of the method that um, we 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 what could be useful based on literature and um, it was like uh, using a Bayesian latent class model. So for that, we used two imperfect tests, ELISA and STJ qPCR, and then um, the same population, the population of um, beef cattle um, from an island. So the priors um, uh, for the um, Bayesian modeling was 
the prevalence of the herd was estimated to be 0.2. The ELISA sensitivity reported by the producer of IDEX, uh, ELISA was 0.6 and specificity of 0.99. And the QPCR uh, that we are testing, STJ QPCR, sensitivity in cattle 0.6 and specificity of 0.99. And the assumption we um, took was the tests are independent based on the inherent characteristic of the test because the one is measuring the humoral immunity and one is measuring the fecal excretion of the bacteria or bacterial DNA. And um, yeah, that, that was the condition, um, assumption that we took. And after we um, um, tabulated, so this is how it looked like. So, um, so they, um, there were like 41 samples um, where both of the uh, test results were positive and there were 210 samples where both of them were negative. So there seems to be a lot of agreement here. So um, the uh, latent class model, uh, the Bayesian latent class model um, estimated the prevalence of um, 0.29 and the sensitivity of QPCR um, was estimated to be 0.63 and ELISA to be 0.65. So both of them look like somewhat similar. And the specificity um, of QPCR was estimated to be 0.98 and, uh, and ELISA to be 0.96, uh, which is somewhere closer to reported by the two tests. So, um, so in cases where uh, we have like imperfect um, reference tests, maybe um, Bayesian latent class model could be one option that we should explore. Uh, so for this analysis, I use the R package, EPR, R2 DAGs, CODA, and MCMC plots for diagnostics and plotting of the models. So further consideration that uh, I'm thinking to bring this work forward is um, using the inhibition resolve test results and um, because uh, the ELISA test that we use for this study um, has a step where uh, in inhibitors are removed. Inhibitors and, um, um, and the DNAs that could um, provide false positive test results are removed in that. So we, we want to give that um, fair chance for this qPCR to so that we can uh, use this result after the inhibition has been resolved and see how they uh, compare to each other. And another is uh, also using like parallel test interpretation and see how um, how you, how the true prevalence of um, the disease in the population and the test characteristics um, changes. And also another um, option we are exploring is using a three imperfect test because um, we also have um, um, fecal culture uh, results um, for these sample types. And another is um, a question we have is like. Are ELISA and QPCR really independent? Although they measure the different component of the disease process, aspect of the disease process, are they really independent? Because um, previous studies, some of them saw a good correlation between these two test results and some has shown poor correlation, um, which um, makes sense because um, those um, uh, observations were for different sample types, different contexts. So we want to see for this, um, context and these sample types um, um, and see if they are really, and then if they are not um, independent based on uh, what we see on correlation, maybe we then use um, those um, parameters in, and put it in the model and try to improve the model. Yeah, thank you for your time. I would like to acknowledge um, uh, all these people and institution who um, helped me do the uh, yeah, major part of the work and yeah, right now also we have direct and indirect help on this work. And I'll be happy to take any questions if there are. Thank you. Thank you so much for presenting, Kamal. Uh, if Thank there are any questions, please put them in chat or you can directly raise hand, however you feel comfortable.
Okay, Kamal, I'm going to ask you one question. So at the last you said, are ELISA and QPCR test results independent and you're not really sure. Have you considered doing a meta-analysis to see what the combined results are in the in the previous studies published? So yeah, yeah, that is, uh, thank you, Steve. That's a good question. Yeah, that is um, one of the um, um, approach we will take. Yeah, we'll also um, base uh, this on our uh, sample to, uh, sample that we have and try to see if they really is concerning doing some sensitivity analysis for the model. And then also, as you said, uh, doing the meta-analysis of uh, previous uh, studies and try to see if we can really come up with one um, parameter for those um, uh, relationship between these two tests and then use it into the model. Yeah, another question that I had was like, uh, considering these ELISA kits were commercially prepared, uh, how much variability have you noticed in these commercially available ELISA kits in terms of sensitivity and specificity? So yeah, um, so yeah, when they validated, yeah, that is the um, uh, values they gave us when they validated the test, right? So when um, we actually use the test, yeah, there has been a lot of variation in this um, ELISA results. Um, so yeah, that is also another consideration because uh, we also did the ELISA um, test on that um, herd for like a couple of times. So mm -hmm. we we will also like um, yeah, try to use those um, variability estimates and try to see how we can incorporate that into the model. Yeah. Yep. Thank you so much. Okay, Pei uh, Yuan has a um, question. Pei. Yeah. Thank you. So thanks, Kama, for the presentation. And I just have a small question. Um, maybe the slide 20. So you show two different uh, test results for two, for two kind of tests. And uh, they have different uh, sensitivity and specificity. And uh, one is greater than another one. So if we have those kind of uh, result, so which one is will be a better tester, tester method for Q, PCR, or this one? So do you compare these two based on these two index, right? Yeah, thank you, Pei. Yeah, no, actually, yeah, that's a big question and good question. Uh, both of these tests have their own strength and weakness. Um, usually, qPCR is better um, suitable um, when we uh, want to uh, diagnose individual level um, because um, the, uh, at the individual level, it can um, discriminate between infected and non-infected most of the time. Mm -hmm. But ELISA, um, because it is measuring the, the humoral immune response, uh, Although we can use it um, at a hard level, try to see um, uh, the estimate prevalence of the disease in the heart based on the humor response that we get from those animals. But then always um, those um, humor response does not um, correlate with the disease situation of the animal. So yeah, it depends. If we want to do like a screening type of thing and try to assess um, the prevalence, ELISA are being used more frequently. And QPCR uh, is also used, also being used for the, that purpose, um, um, and then also for uh, individual animal uh, diagnosis. But as we can see from those uh, these test parameters in this particular herd, which I don't think we can generalize to other types of herd at the moment, unless we have other um, in incorporate other variability in this model. So based on what we see here, maybe these two are like um, can be used interchangeably in this herd because it's like high prevalent herd and then it is a very homogeneous type of population. Um, all the free range animals, um, yeah. Although the age variation is not huge, they are like almost similar as group of, um, yeah, almost five to 10 years variation in age. Okay, thank you. No worries, thank you, Pete. Uh, we have another question in the audience, Helene. Yeah, hi, Kamal. Um, hi. Nice to hear your, your presentation. Uh, a few questions. Uh, so the results you show here from the Bayesian latent class, it looks to me that it's not too identifiable. 
the variance is massive. So have you attempted to one, modify your priors based on the literature to try and have priors that are a little bit stronger that might help you reduce a bit this, this huge variability. Second, have you tried uh, conditional independence because both of your tests are actually measuring antigens or presence of the antigen. Therefore, you know, that assumption of conditional independence may not be met here. I don't know the extent to which this would solve the issue of variance. And third, have you thought of trying to applying it to several populations with, I, I don't know if you have the data for that, that's always hard, mm -hmm. but it could, it could solve some, to me, it looks like it's not identifiable. It's, it's, the, the, the variance is just too big. Yeah, and I find you. it bizarre, the sensitivity specificity, the left tail is just huge. Yeah, thank you, Elian. Yeah, so it is like, um, yeah, I, I, regarding the variability of the and then using different uh, priors uh, yeah i i yeah i i use the one that uh, has been um, that has been reported for those two and yeah which is um, like they reported and they calculated using very ideal type of sample size and this is like completely different sample types which might not have been included in that validation um so yeah, I, I really agree, and I like this idea to to try to see and incorporate different variable uh, types of um, uh, priors and see how we can um, uh, make the better model. And and then regarding the con conditional in independence, yeah, I, I'm like um, based uh, based on how they, this test work, maybe or may not be. So it's like confusing, right? So I, so so the future. Um, step for me is to uh, try to incorporate those uh, conditional uh, dependence of this test and see how it uh, improves the uh, model and I'll, i'm also trying to as you said i i, I might not i might not have pulled on all the um, samples and information from other type of population but i'm trying to see if i can uh, use other population that has been tested and try to um, incorporate it and then include the number of population uh, that in the model and which we obviously um, give to give a better fit and also uh, can be used for uh, generalization of this uh, study finding. Yeah, and if you have several population where the prevalence is not the same, yeah, but like you can assume that the sensitivity and specificity are the same, then it really increases, well, it solves the issue of not identifiability. But, yeah, you I know, would, you need to find these population, which is another yeah. story, right? Yeah. Yeah, thank anyway, you. Anyway, good yeah, job. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Highly appreciated. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we don't have any more questions. So with that, I would like to thank uh, Kamal again for the presentation and the great work that he has shared with us. And I would also like to thank all the audience members. Thank you so much for participating and have a good day. Thank you, Steve. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you.